This program is brought to you by Great Basin College and is sponsored by Barrick Gold North America. Welcome to the oral history recording of the Great Basin Indian Archives. We are interviewing elders of the Great Basin. This recording is available to students and researchers at Great Basin College in Elko, Nevada, as well as on the Great Basin Indian Archives website at www.gbcnv.edu forward slash gbia. My name is Doris Millett Allison. I was born in Austin, Nevada, but basically I lived in Round Mountain, Nevada, where I grew up until I was eight years old when we moved to Duckwater. My family originally are from the, what they call the Urubanawana in Smoky Valley. That's my grandfather's birthplace, his, his land. And on my maternal side, my grandparents were Mamie and Bill Bertram. They're from the Mahagua, they're Mahaguadakana. And my, my Hootsie, my, my father's mother, is uh, Yambaraka. She's from Yamba. Years ago, when she was a little girl, she always said that the, the government were picking their little kids and they picked up her sister and she never knew what became of her. I I don't know why. She didn't know why they were doing this, but I suppose it's because they were intent. The government were intending to educate, civilize, Christianize young Indian people. And that went on here in Duckwater also. After um, the reservation was established in 1940, we moved here from Round Mountain. My dad had a good job in the Round Mountain mines. He was a miner. He gave that up and we moved here supposedly to become ranchers and farmers. And my, we left my great, great grandfather, John Sunday. He told my people that he was not leaving his homeland, that he was going to stay there. And a week before we moved, he, died, he passed away. And his grave is the only grave that is marked right now today. He, he said he was not moving away from his homeland because that's where his family were. And we moved, we moved here where there was nothing. I know for a fact my grandparents, my Guno and my Hootsi, my dad, my mother, grieved for their, their country. We were not really homeless, landless. 
My, my grandfather and my dad had a mine which they worked. They had a ranch, which we called the Apple Ranch. We had a home there on the ranch in Smoky Valley. Then they were, they, they supported themselves by, by doing hauling wood and working in the mines. But we had to leave. And we we moved here to Dakota. There was nothing here for us. We lived in a makeshift tent. We had no drinking water except the water that flowed. There was no jobs. Eventually the government came in and built homes later. And we became ranchers and farmers. They had a program where they gave each family members Ten head of cattle, and then they were called repays. At the end of the year, they would give back to the repay program one or two calves, so that some other family on another reservation could start their cattle herd. That's uh, that's our that was our life in Duckwater. Then, as the years went by, we grew up and moved away. When my dad was killed in an automobile accident when I was 13. We moved away. We moved to Austin, where we lived with our grandparents, our maternal grandparents. And we attended school there. I quit school. I was 14 because there's no way that my mother could take care of all of us. So I added on to the income by working. I worked seeing those jobs for people as a young adult. When I was 18, I, stayed, I came to Duckwater to visit my grandparents and I met my husband. He had a ranch, the ranch that we still live on now. He had a few head of cattle. And our li my life as a mother started then. I've worked so hard all my life. Then after I raised my children, I instantly had seven children. Then both of us worked. We had to support our children, help put them through school. And then after they left, we were foster parents for a long time. We had five foster children, not, at, not all at once, but as time went on, we had one or two. Then after they were grown up, after my last child left home, I went back to school. I went back to, I attended the White Pine high school, got my diploma there. Then my husband allowed me to go to 
Great Basin for two semesters. I left him here. I thank him for that. Then after I received my education, I became tribal judge. And I attended the Judicial College in Reno for three years. Then my youngest daughter was killed in a car crash. We took her to eat her two younger children into our home and raise them. They're still here. And my, my granddaughter has a little girl and she comes and helps me a lot on weekends. But my granddaughter helps different, she, they call on her to help them when they need help in daycare or help them cook or whatever. She, she's available to help around the reservation. And uh, my grandson is a full-time student at Great Basin. Years ago when we were living in Smoky Valley, I remember the new no women used to get together and um, they congregated at a ranch down on the um, valley. They went and all got together and they uh, played hand games and played cards and us kids played together and, and, and then they had a, a dinner that the ladies prepared. This, we did that every Sunday. Sunday. We all got together every Sunday and uh, uh, visited with one another. And uh, that way we, we still communicated with each other to see if anyone needed any help or if they needed any uh, assistance with anything. I remember them help coming to my Gunos uh, ranch and and helping. He had a big bunkhouse where they were, where they used to where the people passing through would stop there and help him. Also at our home in Round Mountain, where they where they had a big bunkhouse, we were never allowed to go in there. Um, but they had. Uh, they had a wood cutting business where they needed all these um, extra hands. And uh, then he paid them. And whenever, whenever they needed money, they would come and help. I was told that my gunner was the first Indian to ever have a brand new car. And people kind of looked up to him because he was uh, kind of a sort of like a leader. My Guno was a half-breed. He had a white father, which he, because of that, he rejected that part of his life, his, uh, his family. And he rejected the English language. And he was instrumental in acquiring these ranches. In fact, I have a picture. I have a picture of uh, of uh, the times when they were negotiating with the with the with the government. 1942, uh, they had series of meetings in different places and they, 
they, they didn't want to leave Smoky Valley, but they were told that the Smoky Valley didn't have enough water and they, did, they couldn't raise uh, crops there. It wasn't feasible for cattle. And so they were told they should go down to Beatty. They wanted all the Indians to go down to Beatty, and they said no, they didn't want to go to Beatty. But uh, Duckwater at that time was um, was uh, bankrupt to the bank, and uh, and it was purchased to to become a reservation. That's how we arrived here. And on my grandfather's side, on Bill Bertram's side, Bill and Mamie, my grandparents have a lot of relatives all over. And uh, my dogo was uh, a constable for the town of Austin where he was uh, appointed to be overseeing the Native Americans there, the Shoshone people. And uh, he broke horses for the cavalry. But when, when I was growing up in Austin, I used to see horses there. We, he had a corral, and he used to ride horses. He, I'm, I guess he was still breaking horses at that time. And he was, um, he made rawhide ropes he was always making ropes. From morning till night, he was up there with his uh, rawhide. And my grandma worked for my grandma worked for people who were throughout the town. When they work for people, they don't really uh, work from eight to five. They work when they get home too. They bring their clothes home and mend it or patch it or whatever. So they constantly work. And I, I don't know how much they were paid, but I think they should have been paid more for overtime. My grandmother was always darning socks and doing sewing for people, even after, after at night. But she never said, she never complained about anything. I liked, I liked to talk to the old people. I was always talking to the old people. I used to visit with Harlan Jackson a lot. He was my Hootsie's family. He said that no one really don't realize nor do they appreciate being who they are, no one He said he felt that came from the devils. That we really didn't live up to our full potential, and we should. He said we should. We should respect ourselves more. Because we're God's chosen people. I shouldn't I mean Naragon peace it. Respect yourselves more, respect who you are, and respect around you whatever, probably the environment. And he said that's, he feels, he feels that we have lost our battle. We have given up. And he said, "Dum daibu abuikan, daibu na kaya dum hisongan." 
Damus away, none and I would think and Damus dares. And he said, Giders on a bubble item and a dego potters and gay, gay nanga in me. No one a gay shine upon, he said. To me, not to me, break the money, nanga with you. There's so much advice out there. Now the young people have lost that. And it's sad to see that a lot of them have rejected our, their, their, native black, their native background. Then who are they? I think it's good to have an education. I think it's good to be assimilated into this society. I think it's good to be your own self too. Be, be proud of who you are. And we've lost that. We've lost the old people who used to advise. I remember my dog. When you did something, he he looked at you. That was enough. He didn't have to say anything. I grew up. I grew up in their home. I saw how they treated people. He had an old Model T Ford that we used to drive down to Battle Mountain and stay with uh, his relatives. We go down to Battle Mountain and stay with his relatives, and they talk way into the night, tell stories, and so I'm related to almost everybody in Battle Mountain. And he, the, last, the last words he said to me was that, not to forget what he had told me. He said, you were, we're related to the Hall family up in Hawaii and Idaho. He said, I said, no, I want to. And he said, again, no, I want to. He said, he said, and he said, you should be happy, whatever you do. You should be happy with Makri Shuangers, he said. Makri Shuangers, Nuhingat Shuangers, Shubai. Yungi Hagaite. Nuhingat Yungi Shuang, he said, Nuhingat Napuide. The humanness in our new culture should be revived. That was their way of life. There was no material things. We work so hard for material things and it's nothing. You should work so hard to be human beings. And when, when, we, when we do these things now, it's really basically for um, monetary purposes or for um, for show. In conclusion, in conclusion with the latter part of my life, in addition to my getting an education, raising my family and becoming a foster parent and getting involved in uh, tribal uh, programs, politics, I wished I had the foresight to see the pro problems as they had existed at that time. and. Uh, been more involved. I think that uh, life is interesting. I think that life has to be lived to its fullest. And that we have a world of gems, which are our children, our families, and with the experiences that the Native American people, Native American Shoshones, have experienced uh, is important to our well-being. Now that I have been in, 
I have been involved in all these things. I appreciate I appreciate my new culture. I appreciate all my newer relatives. And also I'm thankful that I was able to to gain an education and to learn uh, the non-Indian culture and all that it had to offer. We live in this society and this is now the dominant society but we should always remain who we are, be true to our newest selves. I would like the young people to uh, be more receptive to to our Indian inheritance. I would like the young Indian people to be proud of who they are, yet embrace an Indian culture. I want them to be in a society where they are educated in both cultures. With that, I would like to um, thank everyone who made my life complete. For additional information, or to refer an elder of the Great Basin who may be interested in contributing an oral story for preservation, contact Norm Kavanaugh, director of GBIA. Great Basin Indian Archives, brought to you by Great Basin College and sponsored by Barrick Gold North America.